Um, so welcome to the third installment of the Institute for Future Legislators virtual series. Uh, my name is Megan Dias, and I'm the program coordinator for the Institute for Future Legislators at Ryerson. I first became involved with the IFL um, four years ago in Vancouver when I was a grad student at BC. Um, and last year, working with my colleagues at Ryerson, we brought the Institute to Toronto uh, for the first time. Well, I'm sad that we're not able to gather in person this year. Um, I'm really happy to be part of this virtual iteration of the Institute and really happy to have all of you here. Um, I just wanted to give a few housekeeping notes before we start. Um, so this event is being recorded and we will be posting the recording uh, to our different websites. Activity in the chat will not be recorded, however. Um, the chat is open currently and I ask that you take a moment to introduce yourself in it tell us who you are and where you're coming from. Uh, the chat will remain open through the event. At different points, our moderator will directly, sorry, will direct you to quickly respond to a question posed in the chat, and we'll have a few polls for you to engage with, so please keep an eye out for that. Um, at the end of the session, we'll have uh, time for Q&A. If you'd like to ask a question, please send me a direct message through the Zoom chat. And I'll put your questions into queue and let you know when it's time to unmute yourself and ask the question. Or if you prefer, um, I can ask the question on your behalf. Um, and finally, just a, a reminder to please be respectful and mindful um, and kind throughout your comments uh, in this section and, and in the chat. Um, our practitioners today will be talking about how to make room for everyone at the table. And we're hoping to just keep that spirit um, through the Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to Patricia to give our, um, our opening remarks. Great, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Patricia Albanese, and I'm the Associate Dean of Research and Graduate Studies in the Faculty of Arts at Ryerson University. And I'm delighted to have been asked to open this incredibly timely and important event. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we meet today, scattered as we are on traditional territories of Indigenous peoples who are the inhabitants of the land we call Canada. Those of us at Ryerson University are located on the territory of, of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Huron Wendat. It's covered by the Dish with One Spoon uh, Treaty, Treaty 13, and the Williams Treaties. Our co-presenters at UBC are on the unceded land of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. But our participants and viewers, all of you, are spread right across the country. So I ask that you take a moment to reflect on the privilege of being where you are and to acknowledge personally the peoples on whose land you are situated. We should be truly struck by the scale of our debt to Indigenous peoples that we can't adequately inventory today. So to all Indigenous peoples uh, that we need to acknowledge in this meeting, we thank you. I also want to acknowledge that we gather at a time of tremendous tumult in our cities, in North America and across the world. Black, Indigenous and other racialized people have too often been forgotten by our political institutions and denied the fundamental freedoms, opportunities and protections that our constitution pledges us to. Like you, I'm impressed by the tremendous courage of people taking to the streets of our cities and towns to demonstrate their unwillingness to accept the status quo any longer. The unequal sharing of political space is part of our topic for today. But our priorities in all that we do include opening political spaces and doing what we can to empower diverse voices to make change. Today is the third uh, in a series of virtual practitioner sessions that we're holding to try to replicate some of the content that would normally be delivered in the Institute for Future Legislators in Vancouver in, and Toronto that we have not been able to offer in person this summer because of the pandemic. Our intention, and I'm speaking on behalf of both teams at UBC and at Ryerson, is to offer full in-person programs next year. So please keep an eye on our respective websites for more details. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, the Institute for Future Legislators is a program that was developed eight years ago by partners at UBC at the Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions. Last year, the Faculty of Arts at Ryerson partnered with UBC to bring, uh, to bring the program to Toronto. The program provides 
hands-on training and exposure to a repertoire of seasoned political practitioners to develop skills to be an effective legislator. And today, virtually, we aim to do some of that. Today's topic of leadership and representation is timely in our current context of both a global pandemic and an international call for action to address anti-Black racism and systemic injustice. The question of how leaders effectively represent their constituents is particularly relevant, especially for communities that do not see themselves reflected in their government or have not traditionally had power, uh, access to power and decision making. A vibrant democracy includes the participation of the diversity of its members, and today's speakers will highlight how this can, uh, can be done effectively and inclusively. Matthew Green is the minister uh, 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 is a member of Parliament for Hamilton Centre. Prior to being elected MP in 2019, he was the first person of color elected to the Hamilton City Council in 2014. During his time as councillor, Matthew's policy initiatives focused on ecological, equity, and economic justice issues. Prior to serving as an elected official, Matthew owned a small business in Hamilton and was the executive director, director of the Hamilton Center for Civic Inclusion. Andrea Reimer is an adjunct professor of practice and a policy practitioner fellow at UBC School of Public Policy and Global Affairs. In 2008, Andrea was elected to Vancouver City Council and went on to serve for three terms. During her decade on City Council, Andrea spearheaded a number of initiatives, including the city's effort to be the greenest city on earth and creating a framework for reconciliation with Indigenous peoples. After leaving municipal politics, Andrea was awarded a prestigious Loeb Fellowship at Harvard University's Graduate School of Design. And our moderator today is Brittany Andrew Amofa. She's currently the Senior Policy and Research Analyst at the Broadbent Institute. Prior to joining Broadbent, Brittany was on uh, the policy team at the Maytree Foundation, where her work focused on researching various poverty reduction strategies. She's also a former program manager at Harmony Movement, a constituency assistant to Councillor Janet Davis, and has worked for many years in Toronto's homeless and housing sector. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Hello, everyone, again. Uh, we're really happy to be hosting this conversation with, as you've heard, two extremely esteemed guests, uh, Matthew Green and Andrea Reimer. Today's conversation will be about interrogating, dissecting, and critically analyzing leadership and representation. What is representation? What does it mean? What does it mean to be a leader in today's political climate? Who are elected officials accountable to? How should they go about their jobs? And most importantly, how do we get the issues that matter to people the most on the political agenda? So we'll be discussing all of that and more today. So again, thank you so much for joining. To start off the conversation, we're going to begin with a poll question. So you're going to see a poll pop up, pop up sorry, on your screen, and it's going to ask you the following. What does representation mean to you? Choose one or more that applies to you. Seeing yourself in elected officials, having your views reflected, having a say over decisions, or trusting your elected officials to do what's right. So you can choose one or more of those responses. I'm gonna give everybody a moment just to respond. And then the poll results will be shared on the screen shortly. All right, so a majority has voted for having your views reflected with seeing yourself in your elected official, um, reflected in your elected officials coming to a close second. So this is gonna be good or, or make for a really rich conversation. So to segue into the first question, coming off our understanding of what representation means, I wanna go to Matthew first and ask, how have your experiences affected your approach to representation? 
And what does it mean to you as an elected official to represent your constituents? So let's first dive deep into that question. First of all, thank you so much for providing this platform. I'm very happy to be back here again uh, in the Institute, having these critical discussions and what I consider to be, you know, not just a historical moment, but in fact, the new civil rights. So I appreciate um, where, where we have the opportunity to explore and, and interrogate, as you had said. Uh, you know, I think like, like many people of color, many people who are, are marginalized or politically estranged from the systems, you kind of grow up in a, in, a, in a situation where you don't often see yourself reflected in elected political positions. I, I had the privilege here in Hamilton of uh, very early in like fourth grade coming across a man by the name of Lincoln Alexander, who was the first black MP in the country's history, the first black uh, lieutenant um, uh, governor of Ontario. And, you know, I remember saying to my mom, like we were at this event, it was like the International Day of the Child. And I was like, who is that man? I'd never seen the kind of dignity and authority and grace out of a black man, like on a public stage in my life. And she's like, well, he's a politician. And so at fourth grade, I knew what I wanted to be. Um, but, you know, it's safe to say that not all representation reflects our outlooks on, on what we want to see. We have to acknowledge that every community comes with a very, you know, um, a, a very different political spectrum, right? So, so for me, it was, it was not, it was never good enough to see black people elected. Like I needed to see people who shared my values. We're having a values conversation in this country. And, and to be honest, if I could be like very, very frank with everybody here, um, I didn't even see that in the party that I'm in right now for a long time. I didn't see myself reflected, nor did I see the values shared necessarily in, uh, in the NDP kind of their, you know, their shift towards the center felt like it's it left and departed from its, its original roots as being kind of a, a labor party or a socially progressive or a democratic socialist party. So it wasn't until um, Jagmeet Singh ran his, in this historic leadership race to become the first person of color to lead a federal party where I had a decision to make where I was going to be on the sidelines and watch, spectate, or I was going to get in the game and help make history with, uh, with this person and their leadership. And I did that not knowing that I was going to run federally. I was still a, a city councilor. And I, to be honest with you, really enjoyed the autonomy of city council. And I'm sure, you know, uh, Andrea will probably share her experiences there, but but when, they, when, you know, fast forward to, to 2018, we had been three or four years into a conversation around the anti-Black and anti-Indigenous um, policies of policing. And I felt a moral obligation to kind of ensure that we had um, a voice at the table that reflected the lived experiences of the people that, that are my neighbors and my friends and my family right here in Hamilton Center. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Thank you so much, Matthew. And you touched on something or a concept that I want to introduce to the audience. And it's just not representation for the purpose of, you know, having maybe your specific identity represented in elected official. What you're referring to is representation plus substance, right? So having kind of seeing yourself reflected, um, your identity reflected in the elected official, but then also having the values and maybe what your own personal politics represented as well. So it takes representation to a whole other level. Representation 2.0 is sometimes how I like to call it. Uh, so thank you, thank you so much. And I kind of want to bring Andrea into this conversation as well. Uh, Andrea, you know, you have a wealth of experience. Matthew mentioned you are a former city councilor, a lot of municipal experience in BC or in Vancouver, um, uh, in BC in general, uh, city council has parties. It's a party system. So I kind of wanted to get your take on what does, what representation meant to you. And then also how did it fit within the context of city council? Yeah, for sure. Uh, well, so I think I'll start because uh, in my bio, it mentioned that I went to uh, had a prestigious fellowship or something like that at Harvard, which may have given you one um, idea about who I am. Um, Harvard was the first time in my life that I went to post-secondary. That happened uh, when I was 47, right? So I missed out on the sort of normal um, or normal, uh, 
really heavy judgment. Um, most people in elected office um, are not entering university for the first time at 47. Uh, so I grew up, um, I'm a foster kid. I was adopted. Um, my, uh, I recently found out that my blood aligns um, have a very proud tradition of political activism and uh, resistance stemming through um, the Cree and the Métis and the Kanai. Um, and getting to connect with that culture. But the way I experienced it growing up was as a great disconnect. Um, and not only was my birth family quite poor, um, the family that adopted me was only slightly less poor. Um, so we learned, I learned organizing from a young age. If you grew up in poverty, you learn that how you get stuff done is by working together, right? It's not even, it's not a course you take or a, an institute you go to, but just the way that you meet your basic needs. Um, so as I was growing up, um, learned those lessons and left home quite young um, in my early teens and lived on the streets for a period of time, um, worked together with other people um, to get our needs met, but also sort of got this greater understanding that there were these people like Matthew was talking about called politicians who talk into microphones and also were making or not making decisions that were resulting in um, the, the life that I was living in myself, but I think probably more memorable to me is watching people I loved and care about um, live in and lose their lives or lose their quality of life in that process. So I, um, a thing happened, we were marching and petitioning and sitting in and doing creative resistance of all different kinds. And there was this thing coming up called an election. I was like, just, it was the first election I was going to be old enough to vote in. And I was so excited about it. I like to me, it was just so obvious that rather than try and take people who had no connection to the experiences that we had and try and get them to develop the knowledge and the understanding and the empathy that they would need to act on the issues that were so latent in our lives, the easier thing to do would be to elect people who came from those experiences, right? It just seemed like a no brainer to me, uh, but First lesson I learned, not one person that I was working with at the time saw that as a viable pathway. And these were people who, who cared so deeply about these issues, they, did, they could not see the logic in going through the electoral or government process. Um, so, you know, I, I found someone who kind of looked like me, who sounded like me, who had the lived experience of me. I worked hard to like try and, uh, this was back before Google, so you had to like go and like go to offices and go to all candidates meetings. Uh, I thought for sure she was going to win the election. She barely got 200 votes um, in a provincial election where you need close to 50,000 to win. Um, and that gave me a bug. Um, it gave me a bug that um, if we can't, if we have given up so much hope on the one vehicle we have, which is collective organizing towards gaining power in government, um, things are deeply broken. And I've tried to you know, find a way to, to fix those breaks or where I think the breaks are impossible to fix, find new pathways forward. So um, one of those pathways, I, I think if you ask enough people, I spent a lot of time organizing and asking people to run for public office. Eventually someone's like, why aren't you doing this? Um, so I ended up running for public office for school board actually with the Green Party in 2002. Um, I was 29 years old, a woman, and running with the Green Party. At that time in Canada, no one had ever gotten elected with the Green Party, and 29-year-old woman of a uh, questionable ethnic background and with big mouths who'd grown up living on the streets doing sex work and drugs were not the people who got elected. Um, I knocked on 20,000 doors along, not personally, but alongside a team. And uh, ended up coming in ninth out of nine people. We have an at-large system in Vancouver, so coming in ninth actually gets you through the door. Uh, and there I was elected. And so, I mean, the beauty of this is that, I guess the point I'm trying to make is like, I never wasn't coming from that place, right? I didn't really have to learn how to represent because that, that was the whole point of doing this work. You knock on 20,000 doors, you learn a lot about where people are at and where the voices, um, I think, Patricia, in your opening, you talked about the um, asymmetry or the unequal access to space. And man, you stand on someone's doorstep, you learn a lot, not just about how they say they experience it, but through their body language, like viscerally, this lack of access is felt by people. And it's propelled me through all my time in public office. And as Matthew said, um, there's a, I mean, Vancouver's a weird hybrid because we have an autonomy for sure. At, I mean, it's still structured um, the same as other city councils, but we have parties. So we come in 
uh, we have agreed to support a platform. Um, however, city councils are at the bottom of a, a fairly big funnel. So there's many things you can anticipate coming down that funnel at you. And that's where the party system, um, you're open to you know, find your own pathway to a decision on that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. And a common theme that I hear between both of you is that you felt that you saw something needed to happen within the realms of political power and that it somehow along the way it needed to be you. Why would you leave this sort of responsibility or roll up to others when you have this wealth of experience, you have the knowledge, you have the connection to community, which is key. You both have very strong organizing backgrounds. And so representation wasn't something you had to try. It was kind of something that was in, within you inherently. Uh, so I do want to, you know, dive a bit deeper into that and ask, how do you bring in uh, those individuals who voted for you, who organized alongside of you, the doors you've knocked, the people who finally maybe saw you as uh, that person that could bring their experiences uh, to, to political decision making? How did you bring their decisions into your work? And how did you ensure that they felt that they were as much a part of the process as you, you both have become? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw that over to Matthew first. Yeah, like always be organizing. We never stopped. We, we started in Hamilton uh, building a coalition around a, a development project. They wanted to basically move a casino right into one of our code red neighborhoods, which had a life expectancy of 61 years of, um, versus 81 years in the suburbs. And they did that because they knew that they could get greater and more um, broader access to problem gamblers. So it was a very predatory thing the province wanted to do. So we started that in 2012 and everybody said, it's a done deal. It was all the big major families in our city, big bucks. Uh, it's a done deal. You can't stop it. And we organized and we organized a really broad coalition from Dutch reform, like leftist uh, activists from Waterdown and Flamborough to anarchists and socialists and stay at home, you know, parents and caregivers, academics, and we won. And in that process, we recognized as, as Andrea had so, so perfectly put this idea of just having to wait and ask people to do the right thing or to come hat in hand to counsel to always have to plead your case was such a frustrating process that her practice as she, she had identified as ours here in Hamilton Center, which is not to change the hearts and minds of elected people, but to get people elected who already have the hearts and minds. And that's a key, key feature that if anybody who's watching, you know, that what Andrea touched on there is so critically important. And I feel like that's what, what we're doing and we haven't stopped. So this has gone over into labor organizing, things like 15 in fairness, climate justice, you know, Green New Deal, Black Lives Matter, defund the police. The people who work on our electoral campaigns are the like the, the the organizers on the front lines of every single social justice issue in this city mm -hmm. very proudly so so we just don't stop and angia how do you ensure that those who maybe have felt excluded or, or excluded or disenfranchised by the political system and were brought into the process by you how did you ensure that they stayed connected yeah well so many i mean there's so many barriers for people, like these spaces were not created for us, right? In fact, in many ways, white supremacist culture, like it, it was made to exclude us, even if that wasn't a conscious decision that was made. Um, so this, I think it starts with this myth of the expert. I can't tell you how many times I've had people tell me, I can't come to this meeting or I can't be in this space because I don't know enough, right? Um, there's nothing to, to be prime minister of Canada, to be a premier, to be a, a minister or a member or a counselor, the only thing you need to be an expert in is the community that you're fighting to represent, right? And anyone who tells you anything other than that is, is not, you know, consciously or not, that is white supremacist culture, right? This idea that they're, whether it's about two white people or not, is the dominant culture saying, um, we control the gate and you can only get through if you know the things we think are important for you to know. So just let go of that. I think the way that we as electeds at a ground level have to help people let go of that is to see people. To, to honor and value them for who they are, right? And there's many, I mean, it's why, I know it's, it, I was gonna say it seems performative. It is in fact performative in some cases, which is why it seems performative, um, but it isn't just because it is sometimes doesn't mean it always is. So things that we did in Vancouver, like um, declaring the year of reconciliation, um, uh, 
formally passing a motion that we were on the unceded homelands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil like they seem like obvious, like, I mean, they're just truths, right? But being willing to say those truths out loud, being willing to say words like white supremacy or male supremacy or whatever it is, creates the space for people who previously thought they had to be expert in some other thing that some other person came up with, feels like they can walk in. Um, I think there is a legitimate fear of microphones. It may surprise you to know I have personally have that fear. I'm not super big on, on cameras and microphones um, for a variety of deep-seated childhood reasons I could get into. But to say that um, I am very passionate about what I work on and I feel like my fear of these things is quite small compared to that passion. So it's how do you engage and inspire people to that passion? Um, and then also making sure there are other ways. There are people who just have uh, for a variety of reasons, aren't going to show up at a microphone. So where is the online forum? Where is the ability for them to organize through art or their ability to organize through food or all these other creative ways that they can let their voices be heard? And yeah, the one thing I would say, um, good electeds are good organizers. I, I really think that it's like you're not electing someone and it goes both ways. I think we go sometimes to the ballot box thinking like, Oh, thank God, I can just like go over here now for four years and just not pay attention. Um, you're electing people like Matthew and me to give you the shot at having your voice heard, right? As opposed to electing someone who won't give you that shot. It's not about getting to sit back for four years and just let those people go do all that good work over there. Mm -hmm. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. Two things I want to highlight that just left me uh, just, just floored at some of your comments. The first, Matthew, was you saying it's not about changing the hearts and minds of the folks who are elected, but bringing in those who already have the heart and mind to do the job in those spaces. Such a great mantra. And then, Andrea, as you mentioned, it's taking away the myth that you need to be an expert. And so, for so many racialized and marginalized folks, indigenous folks, this idea of who we need to be and what we've been sold on how to be that person um, is, is a barrier for, for many of us, even trying to just simply engage with the system. So really destroying that and, and, and sharing that message, I think is so key. Now, this is a perfect, perfect segue into the next section of, of our talk today. And another poll is actually going to be popping on your screen to ask you a question about how you engage or prefer to contact your elected official. So how do you prefer co contacting your elected officials about an issue, problem, or policy that you would like changed? So this is a one response poll question only. So we're going to leave that up for a bit and give some people time to respond and then we'll share the results shortly. We need that Jeopardy music. <laughs> Not really though. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna put the results on the screen. Email slash snail mail. I, I'm gonna say I'm a little surprised that that is actually the number one answer. So let's dive deep into that. Remember, there is a chat box. So if folks wanna share their ideas, if they have any comments or even share the rationale behind their response, please feel free to use the chat box. So based off kind of what we're seeing our, our participants vote on in that most recent poll. Matthew, I want to know, um, in times like this, or like, how do you connect with your constituents that often don't have their voices heard? What is your preferred method? Or what do you even see out there in terms of how people are trying to connect with you? Well, the first thing is to meet people where they're at. And so that means all of the above. Um, I'll share with you that I do a, a series called Parl to the People. I was doing it daily during COVID at 3 p.m. I was doing these live streams for an hour, bringing on guests, trying to connect people to the process of government. So social media is certainly a big thing and I think is the politics 3.0. But I should say that for all the people who checked email, if you are an elected official, I'm gonna share this with you, that this is the best way to connect with people because it puts a time, it puts a date, it puts in your words what you want as the issue and as what you want for resolution to the issue. And it's great to refer back to when you wanna move a file down the line. Uh, I'll share with you that social media is a great way to 
introduce yourself to a politician or to it or, or to engage in a conversation but very difficult to do critical constituency work so please do continue those emails because with emails they can't pretend like it didn't happen like they can with phone calls or social media as a quick follow-up matthew have you found this time to be a, dip, a bit difficult in terms of the restrictions on public gatherings not being able to meet with people in person how does that all fit into your work uh, when it comes to connecting with people and even having an office that may not be in use in its sure. right now yeah and i like nothing replaces face to face nothing 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 like in my riding i have our local park called gauge park there is an event there every weekend and nothing would replace me having a table at gauge park every weekend and just meeting people face to face going door to door nothing replaces that um certainly phone banking is great as well but but i have to say that in this moment right now with the uncertainty with the inability to predict what's going to be next Social media is that uncharted space where uh, those that adapt well in terms of public education and, and, and connecting with people can build significant platforms. You know, like in the last 28 days, I think like to use Twitter as an example, I think I've reached close to 4 million people. That's a lot for free, you know, in ways that would cost a tremendous amount of money if you had to pay for it. Mm -hmm. wow. And you just couldn't do it in time. Like you just can't do it with time. Yeah, the resurgence. I mean, the online space has been quite active before COVID, but it feels like there's a resurgence of online activity specifically around um, political activity, organizing, activism. Angie, I'd love to hear your thoughts around the best ways that you like to connect with your constituents or have connected with your constituents and the avenues that you found to be most successful. Yeah, well, I mean, it, there isn't one answer to this question, a meta answer, and Matthew gave it, which is you meet people where they are at. Um, so that manifests in a bunch of different ways, right? Because people are in different spaces. I will say that any time I hear an elected official or a government um, employee say, well, we had an event, but nobody came, or like, how do we, like that, it's just, it's mind-bogglingly um, why it's not obvious why they didn't come, right? So. I'll give you an example, and this is not meant to shame staff. This ends well for staff. This reflects well on staff at the end. So I will, I will tell the story of, um, we were doing green building retrofit, uh, no, sorry, not retrofit, efficiency standards for new green buildings and working on single family homes. Uh, this category of builder is called a small builder. It doesn't mean that they're physically small. It means the houses, like they tend to build small houses or they have very few developments that they're doing. So um, I was hearing back quite strongly from that community that they were very upset about these green building bylaws that were coming in. However, um, the staff said, well, we had a consultation and you know, nobody came and we haven't gotten any emails and no one's calling, therefore it must all be fine, right? Um, and I'm like, well, you need to do more, not kind of grokking what the problem was. So that, you know, they had them at different times and no, 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 fast forward. And then I'm like, you know, maybe just go to Temple. A lot of the builders are um, Sikh here in Vancouver. so. Um, the staff went to Temple. Uh, for most of them, in fact, all of them, I think it was the first time they had walked into a Sikh temple. They went through the, you know, the community service part. They did the langar afterwards, and then they had a meeting after, which is very common um, at Temple. And they heard all the concerns and within an hour and a half came to the agreement. But more importantly, um, when they came back to City Hall to tell me the story, um, they, the staff thanked me for providing this opportunity opportunity, this moment where they could go learn about this community. They're now very connected um, and there's a partnership about, it's not the Sikh community and the small building community shares all of the goals around carbon reductions uh, and emissions reductions. They just didn't feel confident coming to a meeting at City Hall, largely during their business hours, which are about 18 hours a day, to speak in a language that often isn't their first to people who don't see them for who they are, right? So like, why would you show up, right? Serving samosas at City Hall is not going to change the fundamental problem here. And um, so meeting people where they're at is critical. I would also point to, um, we did a National Indigenous Peoples Day celebration here um, one year, and I I managed to convince the mayor to not only hold a bannock making contest, but um, participate in it with his bannock recipe, which is not very good for what it's worth. But um, bannock making, every culture has a food where there is a lot of competition around being the best at that food. Um, and understanding that and seeing it and validating and being willing to participate and lose at that competition, um, it, it matters for people in a very substantial mm -hmm. way. 
thank you. And just as a reminder, folks, I'm loving the chat activity that's happening. A lot of great ideas are being shared in there. We will have a Q&A session after this panel discussion. So please stay all the way to the end to uh, ask our panelists your, your questions. But there's a lot of good conversation happening. So I have a question. So, you know, it's all about the policy. People want to help or people want to be involved um, in informing policy, creating good policy and improving the lives and outcomes of, of, of people that they live in. I imagine that's why most people enter into sort of political engagement or political work. So how can constituents do that? Is that their role? Should they have a say in that? How do they get their idea to the elected official? And how do we get movement or action on that particular issue, Matthew? Yeah, this is a fundamental question, particularly coming out of the left. And I'll just share like unabashedly, that's where I'm coming from. Um, where it's this idea of like, where can you bring activism into the inside? And a lot of people certainly get frustrated by riding associations that might be stagnant or stale. They get frustrated with overly um, uh, uh, cumbersome conventions. Uh, but I do believe that politics is about ideas and it is about shared values. And it's certainly about narratives and storytelling. And so I think, it, you know, it does go back to getting involved locally, like living where you lead and, and leading where you live and being involved in, um, you know, this, this, this theory that I have that there's kind of two sets of people. There are those that take the temperatures. So they are, you know, thermometers and then there's thermostats. I consider myself to be a thermostat. I'm going to set the temperature. I'm going to bring the heat and make everybody adjust accordingly where partisan politics is a lot about being a thermometer. And so, you know, if you look at what Black Lives Matter in Canada has accomplished over the last five years, particularly in this new civil rights, it's significant. And that came from outside the party. And they put a set of demands that became the speaking points for over 150 parliamentarians in the, in the Black Caucus's joint letter. If you look at the climate justice movement of young people and intergenerational, really, led by Indigenous people, you know, thinking um, back to I Don't Know More with Teresa Spence, thinking about the Wet'suwet'en um, you know, uh, uh, traditional chiefs and, and, and the interventions around pipelines. Uh, these things come from outside in and it comes from, when we talk about hearts and minds, it really does come from swaying the public opinion in a way that the politicians will follow. Because let's be clear, it's often the case that you will not find leadership in politics. You just won't. You'll find polling, focus groups, You'll find the mushy middle, but very rarely do you find the ability to, um, you know, to, to, to find like real authentic and unabashed leadership. And there's a great comments in the, in the chat right now about Marshall Gantz. I, I, I can tell you that if you're watching this, go in and look up Marshall Gantz. I took his course and it is phenomenal. Uh, and it is about shared values, but you know, from a policy perspective, just think of yourself as the, um, as being the thermostat and having to set the temperature up. And I'll give you an example locally and then I'll, I'll, I'll button up. But uh, we've been trying to fight to get police out of schools for five years, six years now. We know that it has a disproportionate negative impact on black students, but indigenous students, but also all students, particularly lower income students in Hamilton Center. And they wouldn't move on it. And even during the height of the new civil rights, this defund movement, they wouldn't move on it. We had young people shut down the intersection, one of the main intersections here in Hamilton for six hours during the school, the, poli the um, police board, see? The school board meeting, and they actually, they actually um, succumbed to the pressure and removed, they did the right thing and removed police from our inner city schools. But that was through direct action. That wasn't through policy papers or research or all the social sciences because the social sciences are very clear. But people, unless you move uh, the needle on the public perception and the public opinion, you just can't, it's very difficult to get things done. And it was during a huge rainstorm. Absolutely, Sherry. Yeah, I, I can imagine. And, and Matthew touched on so many great points there. And I really want to ensure that our participants know that there are a multitude of ways to inform policy, as Matthew just explained. And 
contacting your elected official and asking them or maybe even educating them on a particular issue as it's affecting vulnerable people within your communities is one way but you know often often as matthew pointed out the one of the most effective ways is external pressure through organizing and activism, through raising awareness. You can raise awareness through writing, through speaking, through you know, educating members of your community, through mass mobilization, you know, even having hundreds of people call your MP at one time. That is political pressure, right? So there's a number of different ways that are outside of kind of the formal mechanisms as it relates to policy making that you can help impact a change or make a difference. So I want to ask Andrea, and I'm hoping Matthew can add, answer this question afterwards. Um, what does good good consultation mean when it comes to having you know your role within political office? How do you ensure that you're doing your due diligence as it relates to making sure that people are heard? But also, what are some of the challenges that you've experienced uh, as, a, as, a, as a former elected, Angia, in terms of getting issues that are so dear to the community on the political agenda, but most importantly, getting the votes to help them help it get passed? Yeah, I mean, so many lessons. Uh, I, mm, so I was in public office for four terms, one at school board, three on um, city council. I've sat on a lot of different boards. I'm still sitting on probably too many boards right now. Um, so have, you know, seen politics play out in a variety of ways behind impacts that I'm trying to make. Um, I guess I would say a few things. Um, yeah, I'm trying to figure out how much of this is confirmation bias, but I'll just say it. And if I'm confirming my own bias, then Matthew's here to hold me accountable for that. Um, I really saw it um, over and over and over again that yeah, there's this political guild, like almost like a class in Canada, a sort of ruling class. And I, I know like white supremacy, men, blah, blah, blah. But I mean, like within that, even a, a layer that considers itself the ruling class, and it uses language and systems and procedures that are deliberately opaque to people. Um, and this is just power protecting itself, right? Like that, like there's no magic or surprise here. It's exactly what you would expect. I cannot tell you how many times I was told, Andrea, nobody wants to see how the sausage gets made. In a democracy, everybody wants, I mean, maybe they don't want to see it, but they want to know they can if they wanted to see how it gets made, right? So. Uh, one of the reasons, in fact, a key driver for me leaving office was I felt like I wanted people to see how the sausage gets made. Like I wanted to teach about power. I wanted to teach about organizing. I wanted to like share um, what we can know. So there is definitely magic in organizing a campaign behind um, changing, a, like transformative change. Um, but a lot of it just isn't. It's very knowable stuff. So rather than pretend like nobody wants to see it or we're not allowed to talk about it, um, I share tools around like the language of power. I put a couple in the chat box there about um, how, it, what does good organizing look like? Like what are the steps? It is a very, break it down into chunks, step by step. There are magic moments in it. Marshall Gantz um, sort of gives you a process by which you can untruth magic in yourself and the community, um, but you need those steps to be able to do it. The other thing I would say about it is, um, this is kind of on all of us, there's a reason that leadership is hard to find in public office, and it's that leaders tend to get whacked down, right? Not just outside, but inside. Like, nobody wants a loud mouth, like Indigenous woman in caucus unless yeah, yeah, or the black man or whatever, right? And let, like, there's a value to your votes, um, but there's an annoyance to having the reality of our life being held up against them all the time and the fact that we're willing to show courage um, that they don't have to show just to show up in the room every day, right? So, you know, it's, it, we, I guess the point is like support people like Matthew, support Matthew, like show up for him. When he's out there leading, you need to show up. If he can do that, you can absolutely find the courage to show up in a rainstorm to make sure that his voice is amplified at the decision making table. Absolutely. And as Angela pointed out, a huge part of this work is demystifying the whole political process. It is complicated, convoluted, purposely. 
and as Andrea pointed out, to protect power. So educating people along the way is so integral. Uh, political literacy um, and, and, and being a part of sharing that with folks is, is so important to strengthening our democracy. Uh, dem our democracy, as important as it is, is, is flawed. Uh, because of the the way the system operates to exclude many folks. So that is a way that we have to continue our ongoing efforts to strengthen the democratic system that we're living in. Uh, so we're going to go to another poll, another po polling question. And we want to hear from you about who you, who are you most likely to contact when you have a problem within your community or with government? Is it a city councilor? Is it your MPP or MLA? Is it your MP? Uh, do you just go straight to social media or do you just keep it to yourself? I'm gonna give people a few moments. As an individual, what are you most comfortable doing uh, when it comes to expressing your concerns as it relates to issues in your community or with government? Brittany, while people are, are, are feeding in on that, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the Ryerson University Institute for Change Leaders under Olivia Chow, which is like a really strong Gantz-oriented leadership course for people to do great organizing. It's got an incredible pedagogy, so the people that are out there, be sure to, to tune in on the Institute for Change Leaders. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you so much for sharing that, Matthew. All right, we're going to share the poll question or the poll answers and responses. Social media, number one. Okay, so let's let's uh, let's unpack that a little bit, right? Because if folks are not going directly to their MP or their MPP or maybe city councilor, we're seeing that social media might be the avenue where people feel that their concerns can be voiced the most. So I want to go to Matthew. You know, we often hear uh, that politicians should stick to their jurisdiction. Uh, that premiers should stay out of municipal governance issues and city councillors should not be addressing federal issues like gun control, for example. But if folks are going to social media and they don't necessarily see the different levels of governments or who's responsible for what, how important is that? What should an elected official actually be doing? Should they be thinking through, through a jurisdictional lens or should they be thinking most importantly about the issues that are impacting their community? We'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I can share with you as a former city councillor, very few Canadians, very few people living in Canada know which levels of government are responsible for what. What they do know is that for whatever issue that has motivated them to contact their local official is a significant issue. It might be something as small as a fence permit or a pothole, or it could be deportation or police brutality. But you need to know as an elected official that for most people, because there are frequent flyers who will call you on every issue every day, but for the vast majority of the people who connect with their, with their local government um, representative, they, it takes a tremendous amount of courage and motivation to do that for the first time. So for me, there is no wrong call. Uh, we take every call as a city councillor. I didn't care what level of government. I would take the call. I would listen. I would engage and I would respond. If that meant connecting them to the appropriate level of government, great. Uh, what we find far too often, though, is that politicians use this jurisdiction idea as a way to pass the buck. And it's vapid. It's hollow. It is irresponsible because what it does is it redirects somebody who's taken the time to connect with their local government. And when I mean local, I mean their local representative. And they just push them off to somebody else. I could do that federally. You know, the vast majority of the things that people call us for are not federal in nature. But I have a responsibility to like public service first, and then the order of government second. And so good functioning democracies take that and they do the constituency work well, and they serve people in their local constituencies. Uh, ones that are there for power, proximity to power, opportunity, uh, they're all too happy to shut the doors you know, and ride it out for the next election. And we see that. We see that by the people that we service from the, riding, from the neighboring ridings who just can't get basic responses to questions. So never accept from an elected official that it's not their responsibility to deal with your concern. Even if it's out of their jurisdiction, they should have the wherewithal to connect you to the proper channels of government to get that answer uh, that you're looking for. Thank you. And Andrea, what are your thoughts about staying in your lane? Is it a flawed concept? Is it something that elected should be doing? What do you think? 
Oh my God. I, I, it was hard not to like go like this while you were asking the question. This is one of those things that drives me crazy. So when I, I was uh, elected to government um, at the city level, I ended up being um, quite ubiquitous internationally because I was, I mean, we were leading on green issues at a time Stephen Harper was prime minister. So the world kind of looked at us and went, wow, like if a city can do what they're doing in a country with Stephen Harper as prime minister, surely to God, the rest of us with much better national governments could be doing a lot more, right? Um, so as a result of that, I ended up in all these places talking to different governments. And I, would, I used to say in Canada, we have this game where we point fingers at other levels of government. I found out everywhere on the planet does this, whether they have, a lot of them are just national to local government. Some of them have five or six layers in between. Um, and this is what we all do, right? So I think uh, what I learned being here in, I mean, we, I make jokes that actually I should have sent Stephen a fruit basket because they actually kind of did us a favor because um, we knew that there was no way they were coming to help. Like on a good day, um, maybe they just wouldn't ram a pipeline down our throats in Vancouver, right? So we never waited for them. Whereas other governments, like the one that is in power right now, well, minority government, so having to share some power sometimes, um, perhaps we would, I know we would have waited more. We would have tried to partner more. We would have said, no, maybe they'll do something, so let's hold off. So what I learned from that, every level of government should do 110, 120, 150% of what it thinks it can do in any given level of jurisdiction, because there are no clear, other than national defense, there's no clear cut lines. Like, like waste is a four layer management, uh, transportation, all four layers. We have regional districts here, so we actually have four levels of government. Um, so whoever you are, whatever role you play in government, and uh, whether you're a resident, a staff person, or an elected official, do 110%, because then when you go to those other levels of government saying, hey, we need you to do something, you're like, and here, we busted our ass to make this happen. Um, so we expect you, with your vastly greater checkbook and legislative authority, to do at least as much as we did, if not more, with it. Um, the other thing I wanted to say, like we talked about good, um, good elected officials or good organizers, that goes down into the community, but it also goes like laterally to the other elected officials, right? So if you don't know, if you ask an MLA who the MP, city councilor, school board trustee, local health board, police board representatives are, and they can't tell you that, do not vote for that person again, or like send them an email with that information. And if they can't answer it the second time, then yeah, just stop voting for them. Arming, you know, yourself with knowledge about who the person is and how they're running for office and why they're running for office. If they don't have those, that basic piece of information about who they're running alongside of, that's, that's a problem. So thank you definitely, Andrea, for, for highlighting that. And I think I, I really wanted to just insert here, um, this is where we need to, I would say, game the system as well, right? And for many elected officials, I would say, you know, unfortunately, we do have a vast majority who are still sticking within the confinements of our political system, who don't want to rattle, you know, the, the boat too much, or are not really interested in bringing the the, the, the amount of changes or certain changes that are needed uh, to better improve the lives of folks who live in this, this country. So you know what, check all your boxes. If you can, contact all three at the same time and let them know that every single one of your elected officials have been informed about this particular issue. Go to social media, go to you know, your, your local community center. If you, if you have the means to do so, it, it doesn't hurt. And unfortunately, because we aren't in a place yet where we have you know, the elected representatives that we need or understand you know, the urgency of our issues, going taking those additional steps sometimes can can really help and, and work as well uh, so the next question uh that i have is is kind of reflecting a little bit on the moment that we're in uh, we are hearing and seeing an uh, an uprising not only in the u.s but also here in canada against ongoing oppression and state-sanctioned violence against black and indigenous peoples so i want to hear from both both the panelists, beginning with Matthew, what advice do you have for individuals who are interested in entering into politics to respond to these calls of justice? How do they start? Where do they begin? You know, given that we know the system is stacked against many of us trying to at least enter, how do we start the process of 
you know, creating that much needed change, but also particularly in this moment now as, as we're seeing, as we're seeing the issues come to the, the forefront. Yeah, I just want to reflect on that this is not uh, new. It's not, an, it's not a new phenomenon. Again, I want to situate this in the leadership of uh, the I Don't Know More movement, Teresa Spence, the direct action for, uh, for clean water and for protections when they, when they did the direct action on the Hill, followed by at least five years of direct action from Black Lives Matter, uh, who have both groups have been uh, targeted, over surveilled, over policed, vilified, denigrated in their work, only to have in a very short cycle. And history doesn't normally provide us with this opportunity, but history has absolved them of their principled positions in a very short order of time. And so now we're seeing this coalesce. If you saw the beautiful action that happened in Toronto with BLM and, and I don't know more and, and the indigenous leadership that was happening there, I would suggest like don't try to enter into a discussion or into a conversation or into a movement without having done your research, without having checked in with people who have already been doing this work. Because one of the things that I'm seeing as a bit of a distraction, particularly in the BLM moment now, is a bunch of people hosting rallies to get the immediate response and gratification and feedback of it being well attended. They're at the front of the mic. They're saying, you know, they have the crowd's attention, but their politics are actually terrible and they're actually counter to the objectives of the movements that got them there in the first place. So, you know, the questions that you need to ask yourself is who is organizing? Are, do they have history in the community? Are they known to the community? Are they speaking for or of the community? Are they from the communities that they're, that they're speaking on behalf of? And rather than jump to the front of the line, like get in the back, support the organizing. If you have time, go to events. If you don't have time, but you have discretionary income, you know, donate to local grassroots groups who've been on the front lines sacrificing themselves for, for, for the last better part of a decade. I think like that's the single most important thing that people can do is not try to just jump in on the moment. Um, I've seen everything from, you know, chants that we love police at Black Lives Matter rallies where, where within, you know, three clicks, you can find out that the, the person who organized it is a degree and a half away from the police association. So in a lot of ways, these groups are being co-opted and these movements and these moments are trying to be co-opted. And I think it's just very important to stay true to the community demands and the calls for justice by backing those calls rather than trying to just take advantage and leverage the moment. It is the new civil rights. It's bigger than anything we've seen. It's bigger than Selma. It's bigger than Vietnam. Uh, it's global and it's significant. And everybody has the opportunity to be a part of it. Can I say one more thing? I know I'm, I'm, I'm taking up a lot of space, but this, this statement is so important that if you ever asked yourself what you'd be doing during the Holocaust, during the civil rights, you know, during the Vietnam War, uh, during apartheid, you're doing it right now. So I'll just let that sit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, definitely. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. And, you know, there's, there's so many roles that people can occupy in this moment. Rallies and activism is one. Supporting organizers is another. Is, you know, fundraising or donating your money is also, but also contacting your elected official and letting them know that this is an issue that matters to you as well is extremely important. Uh, so I wanted to, you know, allow Andrea to respond to this question as well. Like what, what advice do you, do you have for folks in this moment who are interested in responding to these calls of justice? I have a lot of complex feelings about this. I think like all the points Matthew made were bang on. It's complex, right? Like it's not, I often, I mean, this perhaps belies my, the fact that I, you know, gave birth to a child. So pregnancy kind of is a metaphor that works for me, but this idea that you're either something or you're not um, probably only applies to pregnancy. We were talking earlier about our democracy, right? Um, I think I have observed and I learned in my year away um, in the fellowship at Harvard that I myself have thought of you're either in a democracy or you're not. Well, that's not how it works at all. Like there's a huge spectrum, like from autocracy to democracy, um, there's a lot of room in the middle of that. So yes, we're in an imperfect democracy. Um, so being in it doesn't mean we get to stop. We have to keep working on perfecting it. 
And I think this moment um, is a step, a huge, massive leap, um, but still one along a pathway that we're working on. Um, I was elected at a time when, you know, I would say, I would say there were words you couldn't say, although it was, I was never very good at not saying the things <laughs> that you're not supposed to say. So, you know, but there was a price to be paid for using words like patriarchy or misogyny or racism or talking about systemic racism. Um, I, I would say right, right now, like, it, it sounds blithe, but like, honestly, shut up and learn. If you haven't done the work, and most people haven't, which is why we live in the state that we live in, um, you got to shut up and, and learn. But it's not a passive shutting up and learning, right? It's a very energetic and active shutting up and learning. Um, put the microphone down, for God's sakes. Like, you don't need, anyway, you all, you've all read the statements. I'm sure, small statement noted, I'm off, I am learning, and here's how I'm doing it. That's an accountability measure, not a microphone measure. Um, but importantly, the active part, make it possible for people who have done the work um, to pick up the microphone and use it effectively, right? So that is about funding, that's about access, that's about sharing the tools and resources you have um, in ways that people can learn them. I would say all of us benefit from self-awareness and self-regulation. Those two things come hand in hand. So if you haven't taken an implicit association test, if you haven't come up with the debiasing strategies, um, that's problematic. It's always problematic. It's going to be super problematic right now. The last thing I would say, and it speaks to Matthew's point, like I was on a council with five women. Uh, there were 11 of us, five were women. Um, uh, there were five feminists on my council. They were not the five women. So don't make that assumption that because someone um, is black, is indigenous, is a person of color, is female, that they're actively anti-racist or actively feminist, right? Like that there is work associated with this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that circles back to, you know, the response that, that Matthew had at the beginning of this session, that it, it, it's important to know the values that your elected official holds. So yes, absolutely, representation has played, you know, an important role, I would say, within our political system at a moment. You know, there were gains for women entering the system, there were gains for people of color entering to the system, but now this moment calls for something different. We now know that representation doesn't automatically mean that somebody holds a particular set of values, whether it's anti-racist, whether it's feminist values, whether it's, you know, anti-colonial values, etc. So the substance piece is really important. And that's when you start to look at their track record. That's when you start to look at their background experiences. That's when you start to, to listen very closely at the messages and, and, and the politics that they're, that, they're, that they're speaking or spewing to the public. So I think that's really key. And then also, before we move into our last question, anybody who's interested, and I imagine most people in this, in this, uh, on this conference call today are, are interested in this, formal politics is not divorced from activism. The two are hand in hand. Activism is an integral part of informing our political system. So to refute activism is actually to refute, you know, the mechanisms that we need to drive change. So going into um, political office, whether you decide to run, whether you decide to be a staffer, whether you decide to work in civil society, having that lens is really, really, really critical when it comes to occupying roles in these spaces. So lastly, I wanna you know, finish this off before we move into our Q&A. You both started out your political career, careers as community advocates and then municipal politicians, which in some respects has the closest proximity to constituents. But you have since moved on to serve as a representative on the national level, in the case of Matthew Green, and an advocate on the international level. How does building power at the community level that you did for many years compare to building power as an MP? So I'm gonna first hand that over to Matthew to kind of wrap up. What is it like out there? You know, and how is it's your- It's real in these streets. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know what? Like, look, I realized as a city councilor that I was treating the symptoms of really bad provincial and federal policy. I'm talking about cl catastrophic climate change, housing, the economic inequalities, uh, certainly the, the values conversation around, around um, Indigenous sovereignty and, and Indigenous reconciliation, certainly race. Uh, I was dealing with that and every day I would take a hundred phone calls trying to find people shelter and, and connect people with, with critical services. And I recognized that I needed to be at a place where these systems could be challenged, not just the symptoms. 
So I was tired of putting band-aids on a gunshot wound uh, and, and dealing with the inequality here in Hamilton Center and recognize that, that a lot of this was this trickle down from you know, the divisional levels of power under Section 92 that allowed the upper orders of government to deny responsibility to the quality of life of, of, of my neighbors and my neighborhoods. And so you know, that was the impetus. And I think like, if I could share a, a final thought with people, it's that much like your experiences in getting into the prestigious universities that you're now in, everybody's gonna tell you that you can't get in. It's, you know, it's gonna be very difficult. They put up all these illusionary walls, but you know what I found out? I found out that politics, much like life, is the Wizard of Oz. That when you get down that yellow brick road, oftentimes you're around, surrounded by people with no heart, no brains, and no courage. Uh, and you pull back that veil, and it's just a little man saying, pay no attention to the man behind the veil. So to demystify it, you know, it's, this is for everybody. Politics is for you. You can be elected to any level of government. Just take a look at Doug Ford. And, um, you know, you, we can actually create change at all these levels of government. Mm -hmm. And Angie, I'd love to hear as, as an advocate, as an educator, how do you maintain your connections to your former constituents, but also to community in general? I imagine for both of you, this, whether you're an elected or not, the work still continues. Uh, so how do you continue your work in the roles that you occupy now um, in the pursuit of, of change? Yeah, the work definitely continues, uh, but without, I mean, it's definitely like I have a much lower level of accountability, like structural accountability. I, I still feel that level of accountability for sure, especially in this moment um, when there's a lot of young racialized women and indigenous women. Um, you know, when I was talking about supporting people to pick up the microphone, um, there's a lot I can do to support and I've been called on to do. So I feel um, a level of accountability there for all the people who supported me when I was in a position um, of needing to do that and give voices to people. Um, I would say, like, I have a big social media footprint. I also, I mean, I teach about power. So I think, you know, I think about power a lot and like, how do we build power more effectively and more quickly? I might, like, even knowing what I know, I am surprised by how much power I've retained. Like, I lost a title, but that's just, like, one of many ways of holding power in a community. Um, I am pretty indomitable now. Like, it's tough, in fact, because you can't, there's no title to take away anymore, right? So there's nothing to lose at many levels. So I try to be conscious of that, about how I'm moving things forward. The teaching really is, um, I felt very called to teach and to share and mentor and try the democracy lab I'm doing where we're co-creating these tools. A lot of the questions you've asked today, um, we now have like handouts from the democracy lab. They're still kind of being refined or I would share them. Um, they have spelling errors and other things in them, but happy to send like, what are the jurisdictions? And like, if you're working on housing, if you're working on other things, um, I do think like the weird dichotomy, I mean, maybe all of life needs to be irresolvable paradoxes, but city government, you have all the right structures, the possibility of the right structures to get real transformative community driven change done, but your checkbook is like this big and your legislative capacity is like even tinier, right? Um, and so then you look at MPs who have this massive checkbook, they can literally print money, um, there's a consequence to that, but it's technically possible. Um, and this massive, like, like, sky's the limit legislative capacity, but none of the structural tools that you need to be responsive and transformative. And, you know, for those of us um, here on the West Coast, I, I, I don't come from Central Canada. I have no real connection to it outside of it being in the same country. Um, on a good day, we're just happy if, if Central Canada ignores us, right? So like, it's not, I did not grow up wanting to go to Ottawa and be a legislator. I grew up wanting people in Ottawa to not pay much attention to what's happening here and to let us determine our own future, right? So it's a big country to govern. So I'm not sure that's a question, an answer to the question so much as to say, um, it's, you're gonna be, a, if you bring the right intention and some self-awareness and self-regulation, you're going to be effective in the sphere that you choose to be effective in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you so much. This has been a really great conversation. Uh, some key takeaways is, you know, oh, oh, some key takeaways are to know what you don't know. So educate yourself before moving to do any sort of action on a particular issue 
organize, organize, organizing. The organizing doesn't stop once, you know, election day or E-Day is over. It's an ongoing process. And again, always ensuring that the voices that are unheard or the voices that are not normally or usually represented within our political systems, they're brought to the forefront. They're at the front of the line. Right, and, and that's, that's really key and important. So thank you. We're gonna move over to our questions. Questions, and we have somebody up. Hello. Okay, great. So our first question is coming from one of our, our IFL our alumni, um, Nicole. Nicole, if you can unmute yourself and ask the question. Sounds good. Thank you so much for your time, uh, both you, Matthew and Andrea, and of course, Brittany for moderating. Great discussion. Uh, the question I have relates to the process of gathering um, ideas and information about the needs of your constituents to foster representation. So you mentioned the importance of canvassing during the campaign process, and you noted that your organizers were leads on many key social issues within the community, which really helped you um, have a pulse on, on the community and their needs. Um, can you also share maybe one or two additional tactics that you use to research or collect and analyze the stories you heard during these one-on-one -on -one interactions? You want to, I'll, I'll jump in. I'll jump in. Um, well, so the, the I, I, I'm struggling to call it a tactic. Um, I, I, you've probably gotten the sense here. I'm like super extroverted. Pandemic times have been killing me. Um, so like not being able to go out and connect with people is quite difficult for me. So I would hit, I would be at, I mean, not being elected, I'm probably at five to eight events a day of some kind or another out in the community that someone else has organized. Um, and being elected, it was up in the double digits routinely. People thought it was crazy or some sort of tactic, right? It's just like, I need to go connect with other humans. So that's great, right? Have someone on your team who likes to do that. Um, I was not so great at the systematic um, retrieval and analysis of information from those events, but then you have, like, know that, like that's the self-awareness and self-regulation have someone with you who is taking that information um, and is feeding it into some central thing. There is, um, if you haven't heard of the practice of ethnography, ethnography you should know that word um, and you should understand the basic tools that you use to be a good ethnographer because that is essentially, if you're looking for like the structural framework, that is the structural framework. Yeah, and like from my perspective, I think it's important to note that um, you know, there's two ways of leading. You can be a trustee uh, or you could be a delegate. And, you know, I consider myself to be more of a trustee, which is coming from a very rooted sense of values and what I uh, represent and believe in and people can vote for me or, or not. Um, but what I caution is like with populist politics, it, it, it creates a, um, an inertia and leadership because people are constantly just trying to take the temperature. So social media is a big algorithm for me. Phone calls are a big algorithm, like who, who's writing in on issues, uh, just being, staying connected with, with my community. Like I take the bus and if I happen to stray from the, the congruency of my stated values, my folks are going to tell me, like they're going to call me in and they're going to tell me in very real ways. Um, but like for the most part, you know, I think that there's a, there's a, a really big shift towards big data. So know that every single thing that you click, if you look at the tools around Nation Builder and what it can do in terms of tracking people online and, and, and people's people online, uh, that's definitely where politics are today. I find that the other parties tend to be a little bit better at it than we are uh, in terms of tracking big data and acquiring big data. We're still very grassroots and we're still very event oriented, town hall oriented, uh, and like phone tree, phone banking oriented. So, so that's it. I hope that answers it. Awesome. So our next question is from Timothy, who's a UBC uh, student. And he asked me to ask the question on his behalf. So his question is, um, what should citizens do when politicians don't respond to public opinion or pressure? And he's been involved in some of the protests and activism against Kinder Morgan and other pipelines. So that's kind of what he's thinking about. 
yeah, find people, like replace them, <laughs> you know, like you, it's very difficult. Like someone's not going to change my value set. So I'm going to get elected on my values, good or bad and how they're received in my community. It so happens my community raised me. So my values reflect my community, at least I think. Uh, but if, if it's the case that they're not receptive or that they are coasting on, a, you know, a partisan um, coattail, then join a riding association and organize against them and organize hard and know that it's like a four year deal and you're going to have to put in a lot of work to replace power because it doesn't just give itself up voluntarily. Yeah. Kenya Morgan's it's like, <laughs> good question, Timothy. Um, I would say a couple things. Um, one is that, so when Kinder Morgan proposal, I was going to explain the issue, which I like to do, but I'm guessing every single person on this call knows that if you don't send me a note, happy to explain the background of it. Um, so Kinder Morgan was a very live issue when I was elected to council, still is. Um, we, the, Stephen Harper was prime minister at the time it first came up, the application to the National Energy Board. We were convinced that uh, we would not win that battle. So while we fought it, because you still have to, you know, you can't, you can't win through attrition. You can't just let them win. You have to fight them even when you know you're going to lose because it's like playing pool. You're setting up for where the cue ball is going to go, even if you can't take a shot, right? That's what we were trying to do. Um, the second thing we did, though, was launch an international effort to make, uh, we wanted 10% of the world cities to sign on to 100% renewable energy targets, um, because we felt, I mean, think about this, we were so sure democracy was going to fail us in this regard, which it did, um, that we were prepared to do an international campaign to convince the world to stop using oil and gas, because we thought that would be more likely. And as it turns out, that is it. Like, we've been stalling for time, um, because we knew that every single day that pipeline isn't being built, if we're winning on the 100% renewable goals, there's just no money there to build that pipeline. And that is indeed where we're at. Did we foresee that a liberal government would buy the pipeline on all of our behalf? No, we didn't see that coming. So at that point, yes, you do need to organize um, and figure out how to replace them. One small thing I would say, it's not true in the case of Kinder Morgan, but it is sometimes true that our ass, and I say this as an activist, um, we have asked for things that are not doable, right? Um, they're not the next logical step. So you really do need to think about like whatever you think is doable and then double it again, that's probably a reasonable ask. But don't ask for, like, don't, you know, increase it 10 times and make it impossible. It's that perfect being the enemy of the super fantastic, right? Like how, that's an art. That's where the magic is in campaigning. Um, and where having relationships with elected officials really helps you refine that. Sorry, they don't need to be the elected officials you're targeting, just someone who can tell you what uh, sort of, I hesitate to use the word reasonable because you shouldn't be confined to reasonable, but you should be confined to doable. Awesome, thank you. Um, so the next question is from Austin. So Austin also asked that I ask the question on his behalf. Um, so his question is, what would you do if you find yourself in a situation where the majority of your constituents vote for something that's against what you believe? Um, what would you do in this black and white situation? We both have muted exactly the same time. All right. I, I defer. I, I would love to hear your answer. You've been fantastic. Um, I like personally, I do believe I'm a very strong believer that um, you're there to represent. I also believe that you're there, like you need to have baseline values. There are, um, so ethics are like societal um, norms that you're, conforming to or not, um, morals are your own. And if something goes against your moral code, um, I, I, you know, a woman's right to choose is a fundamental issue for me. If 99.9% .9 of my constituents supported um, making abortion illegal, I would still get up there. I would drag myself there if I had to and vote against it because I just think it's a moral issue. Um, we, housing in Vancouver, it's a very live, um, when I was talking about having regrets around consultation, I regret having put some issue, some social housing to consultation. It just should not have gone. Those, there were, there were situations where people's absolute right to housing was being threatened by that consultation by people who had housing and it just should not have been allowed. I know it's a common practice at city governments to put housing to consultation, but I think there are circumstances where if it's a moral issue for you, you shouldn't go to the public and, and not be clear about the fact that it is a moral issue for you. 
Yeah, that's a fantastic perspective. And I think it, it, you know, things can be black and white, but for me, it is about like, what is the situation of power? Who does, who, who do the masses represent versus who's being marginalized? Uh, for me is, is, is an often an important question because it, it does go back to this idea that, uh, you know, when you're looking at white supremacy, when you're looking at colonialism, when you're looking at patriarchy, all of these things are at all points in time, like the major, uh, um, most popular held value, whether it's consciously or unconsciously. So if it's an issue of a bike lane, actually, I shouldn't even say bike lanes because I did push a bike lane through that wasn't necessarily popular. You know what? I'm probably going down with the ship. I'm going to be honest with you. I try to be as candid, as open, as honest with people during the election. They vote for me or they don't. Um, and, you know, if, if it's a principled thing, if it's something about style, you know, or is it like, if it's something on principle, then I'm going down with the principles and I'll, I'll pay for it one way or another at election time. And I'm okay with it. If, if I can add one more thing, that's kind of, kind of been my catchphrase today is that I am okay to not be reelected. And for me, that's my liberation theory in politics is I'm willing to walk away. I'm going to walk away and look Matthew Green in the eye and my son Langston and be okay with the decisions I made because my circumference on, on principle and value is just something I won't, I won't trade in for votes. Can I add in something very quickly? Um, one, thank you so much for saying that, that Matthew, and as somebody who works outside of the political system, it's really important to not see your position in the legislature or on council as a forever job or a career. It's one role to a means to an end, meaning that the way we talk about issues, the way we fight for issues, the way we represent people doesn't only happen in office, right? But when you're stuck on constantly trying to get reelected, it actually prevents you from doing, I think, the necessary work. So thank you. And lastly, I just wanted to say it's so important for folks to have an anchor. So know what your values are, know what you came into office for know what you know your mission was um, in the first place and obviously being you know flexible and, and being nimble and, and responding to your constituents when when necessary or when need be but having that anchor will help you determine when you fold or when you stay firm on a particular issue so do that work before you pursue political office <laughs> Okay, just because we're running short on time, I'm going to get the next two people to ask their questions back to back and then um, go for response. So we have uh, Pawan with a question and Alex with a question. Uh, Pawan, if you want to go first and then Alex can follow right after. Gotcha. Thank you. Uh, hopefully y'all can hear me. Cool. Um, so my question is, uh, is this. So many people don't uh, leave politics or don't get involved in the first place because it's dirty and it, the horse trading it kind of involves. Um, reflecting on how common anti-marginalized actions and policies are passed at all levels of government, do you think that marginalized folks are more likely, like, more likely to be tired of politics or you know, to, to not be interested in joining the first place and have like, a higher bar of entry or just leading uh, earlier? Unfortunately, it sounded like a 90s synth pop uh, hit. We couldn't hear you. It was yeah. very pixelated. <laughs> like on a Korg or some, some like mid nineties synthesizer. Oh boy. Um, that might be my internet. I apologize. Um, maybe the second person can go and I can try to figure out my internet. Can hear you now, ironically, but. I, I can talk now quickly and then hopefully your internet will sort itself out. Um, so my question is concerning institutional constraints. So as someone with a background in student activism and with very strongly held beliefs, I was wondering if, either of you could speak on um, ever having a particular policy solution in mind um, going into the position and then uh, once you are elected realizing that that position um, may not be able to be selected because of the constraints of your position and the institution that you are in whether that is like city council or whether that is parliament in general um, that was my question. Yeah, I feel, you know, I get asked this question from time to time and I can't figure out if I just was blessed to work with the right team at the right time or something. I don't know. I've been elected to school board and then been an activist and then elected to council. So 
I think that helped that I kind of knew what I was asking for by the second time around school board. I think there was a lot I ran on that was like not even kind of sort of doable, but then it was just me, right? I was the only green there. Um, so yeah, there was learning curves all over the place for me, for the party, for everybody. Um, but yeah, in my time at council, there's only two votes that I was involved in where I was like, huh, like, should I be holding a, a stronger mind here? I always felt like people respected, not all the people, but enough. You only need, that's a very important lesson about politics. You do not need 100%. It, you need 50% plus one, man. And if you have a tough time having people annoyed with you, you are not going to do well in um, pushing the envelope. So um, I was always able to pull together the coalition to the solution that I wanted. I like this idea around compromise. I certainly compromise my judgment of individuals who might not see the same solution immediately as I did, but I like I learned how to be more respectful um, that there's lots of good reasons people haven't come to the same conclusion. Uh, but I never, I, there's not a vote I can point to where I, 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 the one thing I will say is time, holy crap, does it take a long time, but you're moving a super tanker the size of a city, it should take a long time to move. Like, I thank God on the issues I care about that some regressive government can't come in and just snap their fingers, right? So it cuts both ways, for sure. We've actually watched a regressive government come in and snap their fingers and roll back a lot here in Ontario. And if there was a lesson to be learned from Doug Ford, it's that you can be radical. He's radical in the wrong way but that you can be radical provided you have the, the political capital around the table to get it done. I know as a city councillor, I became the unofficial uh, official opposition and I would vote against my colleagues on issues of principle. And, I, and, and what I think I've learned the most, city councils move relatively quickly compared to other levels of government, is just patience. It's like being, being clear, and I try to share this with our activists here who are just doing like rad work in Hamilton, that this is going to be a generational shift. We are having an intergenerational values conversation and it's not a five-year turnaround. It's certainly not a four-year turnaround on a campus, but you, you, you get, you learn the skills and tactics and principles to carry this out. And I'm, I'm seeing now some issues that I took on in 2014, 2015, 2016 come back around and I can point back to those decisions with clarity and say, I voted against what was popular because it was principled. I voted against my colleagues when it was uncomfortable, you know, to defund police, to reinvest in communities, to have higher accountabilities, to do rad things around the environment, you know. Um, and, and I think you have to have that long-term perspective that the single most important thing you can do, as Brittany has identified and reiterated, is to get very clear about what your principles are and be unwavering, but you don't have to compromise them. Liberals do that. A little partisan thing there, but like if you're, if you're truly you know, believing in, in the cause that you're, that you're running for versus just being in proximity to power, um, then you don't have to do that. You ought not. Thank you, you know what, is that even fair? Like, I'm wondering how fair that is because like I'll share with you in a candid way that there's a lot of problematic things that came out of the West Coast under Horrigan that I think the activist me would have been, would have been more rabid about, where I, you know, I certainly pushed back, but not, and I've certainly supported the Wet'suwet'en um, processes to take place, you know, but maybe within that constraint, maybe I wasn't as, as um, outspoken as I may have been if that was a liberal government, if I'm being fair. In retrospect, so that's a good question, Alexandra. Thank you. One thing to remember on the West Coast here is that we have an NDP and BC Liberal. You always must put those two words together because it is not equivalent to federal liberal and nothing in the middle, right? So we, um, so the NDP sort of can extend into what might be a liberal position in Central Canada and the other party as well, right? So it's a bit harder to judge based on the labels here. Thank you for that grace, Andrea. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, Megan, we lost you as a moderator. Did you have? Oh, one? sorry. Um, so I think we're actually out of time, um, unfortunately. Um, but we did have a couple more questions that I've directed people to to bring to social media. So hopefully we can continue that conversation um, there. But I think John Beebe is going to to wrap us up. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Um, and I know that there are a bunch of other folks uh, who would have awesome questions to ask and hoping that we can continue the conversation online. We've shared uh, Matthew and Andrea and Brittany's social media um, and would invite you to continue online using the hashtag, um, uh, and I'll be corrected in the chat if I'm wrong, but hashtag IFL. Um, oh, nope. What's our, what's our? IFL are you? Oh, IFL are you? Okay. But, um, and then, but we also want to get UBC in there too. So, all right. We will, uh, it's all good. All right. And, but, um, you know, clearly an incredible conversation, um, with so much to unpack. And I, I really appreciate Matthew and Andrea and Brittany facilitating that, uh, leading, really leading that conversation. Um, you know, a couple of, of key things stuck with me because at the Democratic Engagement Exchange, we're really committed to also supporting many of the same approaches. And one issue that is always a challenge when we hear folks who say, you know, oh, I don't know enough to be involved. Um, and that piece, yes, it's complicated. Yes, there's folks behind the curtain. Yes, it's like that we need to do our homework. All of that piece would like is all on us. But then also any of us, all of us have lived experience that we can bring to this conversation. Um, and especially folks who haven't had that message delivered to them every day for their life and have actually often heard the opposite that, you know, that's what they've been told whether it's in their, from their school or from whatever environment they've been in, to getting that message. So really appreciate that message coming out loud and clear. And then, yes, let's all get in there. Let's do our homework. Let's activate. Let's engage um, our democracy. But um, I think that we need to figure out how to create those inviting spaces. And I think Matthew and Andrea have given us tons of tools to do that and to invite more people into the conversation, invite more people to the table and set up the table so that they can be there and part of that, this conversation. So really appreciate that. Um, again, I, lots of other things that I will be looking forward to unpacking going forward, but we now have, I uh, hope you will return uh, and join us in a couple of weeks when we have another, where I think there's one of a conversation I'm really looking forward to learning from um, with Damian Lee and Marissa Matthews on making spaces for indigenous government governance, where we're gonna get to learn from two scholars and leaders um, about things that we can learn from indigenous governance here in Canada um, and as potential future legislators, uh, what we can learn after that. Uh, we'll have a session about communication and tools for effective political communication before wrapping up the series in August by bringing back some of the alumni from the program. Uh, again, um, we hope to continue these conversations. We hope many of you will be able to join us uh, as participants in the IFL when we return next year in person. Um, and really, um, I feel uh, more energized uh, after this session uh, than I have in the last couple of days. So I'm personally appreciative and wish everyone uh, the best and hope to see you uh, both virtually and then really much in person. So again, with uh, great gratitude to the team at UBC, the team at Ryerson, and everyone who's been able to join us to make this series possible. Um, and we will um, see you at the next uh, event and at, at future gatherings uh, in all sorts of formats. So appreciate it, be in touch uh, and be well. And one last thing, we're gonna keep the uh, chat open a little bit um, 
too. So if folks have resources or uh, things that they wanted to share, uh, go feel free to do that as well. Then we'll be sharing those uh, out through email to everyone who participated. Um, so we, we will, yeah, we're, we're going to continue these conversations in a variety of formats. So thank you all.